Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions and we are located in San Dimas, California. And today we're going to be covering a gold partial coverage restoration, specifically the 7 8 partial gold restoration. This is just an example of one of my cases. It's an endotically treated tooth. We removed the temporary material, performed a buildup with amalgam, and then we went ahead and prepped the tooth with the rubber dam on. You can see it was a little deep on the distal. Took an impression and note the grooves. You can see it here again as well and also how far we got beyond the uh, finish line with the impression. And it's a nice restoration. And uh, This particular patient on a second molar, it never showed when he smiled. It was great. This is a modified 7 8 crown, something I learned from Dr. Richard V. Tucker. And same procedure clean it out, build up, this time with composite. You notice this one doesn't really have grooves. It's a little different, but uh, equally uh, satisfactory. It provided this patient with uh, a long-term restoration. We can take a look at a more recent case I did. An endodontically treated tooth that had a large vertical fracture, so we were basically doing heroic dentistry here, but I went ahead and build it up and use a fiber post. There's the restoration, no grooves, kind of these hollow grinds, and then cemented the restoration, finished and polished it, and had a nice uh, result. So today though, we're gonna talk about the Schillingberg design. And let's start by just looking at a diagram that I drew of the uh, preparation. And you're gonna see that the gold that will lay over this preparation will have thickness of 1.5 over the lingual cusp, the A plane, 1.5 on the B plane in the middle, and then one millimeter on the C plane. In order to strengthen that finish line, we're going to create an offset that's approximately 0.5 millimeters deep, and we need a finishing bevel of about 0.3 to 0.5. The retention groove needs to be kept above the finish line by about half a millimeter. And finally, of course, we're going to have a modified chamfer which has a declination angle of about 60 degrees. So this is our goal today. We're going to start by uh, looking at the occlusion and getting an idea of where the cusps lay relative to the opposing tooth. We do want to maintain uh, a morphology of this reduction that mimics tooth structure, that, you know, the shape, so that it tends to hide the restoration a little bit better. It tends to blend better. Using a typodont, you can clearly mark on the typodont to get an idea of where all of your reduction planes need to line up. It's also good to maybe, at about a 45 degree angle, put a little pencil line to give yourself an idea of where that extension is going to be. That may seem like a lot, but actually when you look from the facial, you won't even be able to see the gold. So let's get started. We're going to go ahead and I'm just going to make a little 0.5 millimeter reduction because we just want to remove just a little bit off the cusp tip. But from here we're going to be progressively increasing the depth to the central groove area where it will be 1.5. You can measure that area there. It's just about 0.5 millimeters in depth so far. This is not the offset. This is just the initial reduction off the cusp tip. Okay, so at this point, let's go ahead and continue with the 57 burr. And you, you could use a diamond, but I like the 57 burr. Uh, it tends to cut very nicely for our gold preps that can be very, very uh, sharp and uh, well-defined internally. And we're going to use this burr, as we have done in many other videos, to complete the occlusal preparation, following all the guidelines that we've shown over and over again in previous videos, so there's no need to go through every step. So here we are just at the very end, finishing up the occlusal morphology, maintaining the angles of the planes to mimic the adjacent teeth, and trying to keep things uh, relatively smooth on the occlusal. So of course when we're done we end up with uh, something like this and there's nothing new about this we've done this a bunch in my videos but we're going to go ahead and mark right now where we'd like to have the flare on the 
mesial, and they're where we want to have the finish line on the buckle mesial to the buckle groove so that the gold will be ending on a convex surface and not a concave groove area. It's a lot easier to get a good finish line when you're finishing the gold against a convex surface rather than a concave one. So the groove will be located somewhere in that uh, mid facial area, but the finish line will be mesial to that. And obviously I would not draw on a patient's tooth, but if you want to and you're typing on, it's not a bad idea just to kind of get to know where you're headed with the procedure. So we're going to use the Axa Reduction Burr, the 878K012, which will give us a very conservative chamfer at first, but it gives us really an optimal taper. And the burr is fairly thin, so it allows you to go interproximal to develop that technique that we've taught before where we have that divide and conquer technique where we leave a little bit of contact not broken and then we subsequently use a much smaller burr to break through. Of course in the clinical situation your finish line location will be dictated by retention form, resistance form, existing restorations, carries, root coverage, things like that. But in the type knot, we're going to keep it super gingival. I'm just moving the 878K a little bit further interproximal so that we have a very small amount of interproximal material to remove when we go to the needle shape burr. Be careful you don't nick the adjacent teeth, but go as far as you can at this time. Such a wonderful uh, burr to create proper taper and the initial chamfer. Now we're going to uh, remind ourselves that the finish line is going to go uh, mesial to the middle of the tooth so that we end our gold on a convex surface. And I sometimes like to just even start the burr right in that location uh, so that I know that I've got past the groove. I definitely want to come back to it and recapitulate this axial reduction to make sure that our finish line is mesial to that buccal depression. Once again, get as far as you can interproximally so that we minimize the amount of interproximal reduction. Notice also that you have two planes. You have this initial plane of the gingival and then you have a subsequently kind of tipped plane to account for the contours of the teeth, the contour plane versus the retention plane down to the gingival. I like to use the adjacent teeth for this to get an idea how we're angling things. So at this point, uh, we've got the finish line location figured out. It's not quite deep enough axially, and we've gone as far as we can interproximal without hitting the adjacent tooth. So now it's time to utilize the 859-010 needle shape burr. And as we've done in the past, it's just a matter of doing stepwise work. Uh, I kind of like to think of this as like going up an escalator at an angle. You're not uh, trying to push the whole burr through, but you're kind of making these little steps as you go from the gingival to the occlusal. I'll just make it a little closer here so you can see what we're doing. This would be the, the view I would uh, normally get with uh, 12 power on my uh, microscope. And that's probably as about as close as I want to get when I'm performing the initial preparation. I'll turn it all the way up to 30 power when I'm refining the finish line at the end. But uh, breaking through a contact like this, you don't want to get too close because you can lose perspective of uh, where your burr is angled, etc. Notice the shell protecting the adjacent tooth. And the needle shaped burr is about as small as you can get in dentistry. So if you have a very, very thin, like less than a tenth of a millimeter shell, and you're using the burr straight up and down, you're not making any errors. This is the way it's supposed to go. Sometimes people worry that they're going too deep axially and they end up hitting the adjacent tooth. So let's be careful about that. The mesial side is going to flare out at that angle. 
not like an amalgam exit angle, but more like maybe a composite or a gold inlay exit angle. The exit angle you would have perhaps on a gold onlay. Three quarter crown, seven eighths crown, they're all the same. It's about 90 degrees plus 45, so relative to the axial wall, that angle there forms an obtuse angle of 135 degrees. Now I'm moving back to the 878K012, and the reason for this is that we've created a lot of irregularities in proximal. We've got some disturbances in the in the uniformity in the form of the preparation. So I like to go back around at this point and and fix the taper, make it uniform. Look for areas where the finish line is not uniform above the tissue. Look for areas where you may have an undercut or maybe you've over tapered so you can make some corrections at this time before you go on to finishing the chamfer. So, so far so good. Uh, axially it's probably not deep enough but I can see the finish line all the way around. We probably want to have just a little bit more clearance on the facial so that we can have an easier time finishing the gold if we were going to cement this and finish it with discs as we typically do. So let's now make the axial a little bit thicker and we'll use the 8877 010. 010 means that it's, it's a millimeter wide. It's a cylindrical burr so you have to be careful about inadvertently creating undercuts. I mainly use this just to refine the chamfer and make the axials a little deeper. So now we're moving along and we're going to make this little triangle here between the axial wall, the flare angle, and a line that goes mesial distal. And the groove will be located right in that location. I call this the triangle of success. And then we're going to make another one of these on the facial that is going to uh, then allow us to line up these two grooves together, you know, uh, with an offset. So here's the 169L starting at the top and working our way more gingerly kind of in a stair-stepping technique. Not trying to do it all at once, but lining up your burr along the long axis of the line of draw of the preparation, and then working it down towards the finish line, making sure we stop short of the finish line by approximately 0.5 millimeters. We can then hold our, the handpiece in the groove on the mesial and then transition with a finger rest, being stable, onto the facial to create this facial groove, which will provide us with bulk, and durability of that finish line and a little bit of additional retention and resistance form. So at this point let's use a blue dry erase pen so that we can easily see where we're going to be making the offset which is going to be approximately the same depth as the tip of a 169L burr and we're going to follow the external outline form of the cusp on the mesial facial. At this point we're going to use a 7404 to create a 0.3 to 0.5 millimeter contra bevel and on the distal facial cusp a little heavier perhaps 0.5. Okay there we go. At this point I think um, the preparation is uh, pretty much done um, and we see we have plenty of retention resistance form um, I've tried to make it um, smooth. Sometimes it's helpful to use uh, hand instruments like chisels and hoes and hatchets and things like that to uh, make things a little bit cleaner. And we see that we have the uh, final preparation done. Uh, and you know, when you look from the facial, it's kind of cool. You don't really, see, you're not really going to see the gold when it's in the patient's mouth. And the clearance on the on the mesial facial is one millimeter and 1.5 in the distal facial. Of course the lingual cusp are going to have 1.5 millimeters of clearance. If you happen to hit the adjacent teeth, uh, just make sure you smooth them with a disc. It sometimes happens. But uh, you'll get better at that by uh, practicing and, and avoid the adjacent teeth a little bit better. But I really like this preparation and I try to do it as much as I can in patients that will allow me to use gold, uh, particularly on second molars and sometimes on first molars. 
it seems to be a nice uh, preparation. We can even do it on lower teeth, but that's a completely different preparation, and maybe I'll do that in the future for everybody. But I hope everybody is safe uh, during this pandemic, and uh, let me know what you think of this video. Take care.